Hi. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as I was starting to say, no, um, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Appreciate that. Um, I hope, uh, hope your various protests and, and, uh, and uh, such are going to get in the way of a, of a great evening like this, and it obviously is not. So, uh, we're going to be talking about something that's rather interesting, and I say rather interesting because when this was first announced uh, a number of months before the anniversary update came out back in August, uh, and uh, I actually should find out what the exact date was, but I know f from the thought of this, just hearing this, the fact that Microsoft was actually going to be running Linux on Windows. I thought, well, that's, wow. I mean, I, I knew Microsoft was becoming a different company. We were certainly opening up to open source, and Microsoft loves Linux these days. Um, you know, our, our company is, is the biggest contributor to open source technology now today. According to GitHub, we are the biggest contributor to open source projects on GitHub right now, um, and which is, I think, a, a testimony to uh, our drive to support the open source community. And a big part of that is supporting open source developers. And to do that, we need to be able to make sure that you have tooling available to you in the environment that you want to use. And it shouldn't be a matter of, and this is actually one of our, our stated goals around Windows, we don't want you to go for, to just have to, have to use Windows, right? You have to use a Linux box, you have to use a Mac, and you have to use Windows for whatever. We want you to be able to go from having to use Windows to liking Windows, to loving Windows, to wanting to be, you know, to, to not be able to live without having Windows on a box for everything that you do, whatever kind of productivity, whatever kind of development, whatever tools you're using. Uh, so that's really the big part of what we're doing with things such as containerization on Windows, we're crying out loud. We're running actually Windows containers. I don't know why I'm just doing this. Some, some process on my, on my computer wants me to authenticate. It might be my office stuff here, so. If that comes up again, I'll see if I can uh, maybe shut down the OneDrive. All right, um, so we, uh, and by the way, that's a, that's a little demonstration of Windows Hello, right? My fingerprint logged me on my keyboard here. Um, so uh, th it's really crazy that we're doing these, these technologies in the open source space and supporting open source technologies also in Azure. Azure is, our, of course, our cloud environment. And uh, right now, uh, a, a third of the workloads running in Azure are actually Linux workloads. And that number is increasing every week. Uh, we're outpacing new workloads running Linux to Windows about three to one right now. Uh, so it, it's gaining on it. We need to support this because this is where people are at. This is what people are using. This is what developers are building tools for. This is what applications are, are running on for the sake of business. So we built this subsystem for Linux. And uh, part of my agenda today is going to be showing you what this is all about. What did we, how did this get built? What's some of the history behind this? Uh, what is the uh, kind of a, a overview of the architecture of that and how to actually then activate this Windows subsystem for Linux on Windows 10. Uh, then we'll go into uh, a demonstration of what it can do. Um, it's, uh, so it's kind of an introduction to Bash. Um, let me just ask this before we continue on. How many of you are familiar with Linux, have worked with a Bash shell or other uh, distribution of Linux? All right, oh, well over half, almost everybody, awesome. Uh, so uh, some of this won't be uh, uh, new to you, so I won't spend an awful lot of time uh, on some of the basics. But you know, we're gonna show that we can also not only support this, this Linux environment, uh, but also supporting graphical applications as well. We actually have support for X11 and GDK graphical applications. Uh, we'll talk, talk about some of the current features and also some of the limitations. Um, this is a product uh, capability that is currently in beta, so there are things that are going to work and there are things that are not going to work, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and also how you can, very importantly, help contribute to the community, uh, try things out for us, uh, report back what works, what doesn't, and so on, so we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about what the developer workflow looks like with this, give you a couple of examples of the, things, the sorts of things you can do and some additional tooling that you can take advantage of uh, to work with your local system, to work with uh, and, and troubleshoot or work with web applications, to build up with some of the more familiar tools that open source developers like, uh, and then uh, such as Jekyll and, and uh, Node.js and uh, C++, uh, Python, Ruby, we have all these that are available to us in Bash. I'll show, show off some of these in my last demonstration. So this uh, Windows, some system for Linux, uh, is, uh, has, has kind of a longer history than you might think. Um, we've actually been supporting a subsystem in Windows since Windows NT days uh, in order to make this happen. Uh, there was a subsystem that we built in NT that was uh, the, the goal with this being to support other operating environments, other applications or other application types that were built for other operating environments, such as POSIX, OS2, and of course the Win32 subsystems, which are the ones that you're more familiar with today. But, you know, we could run OS2 apps on Windows, we could run POSIX apps. Uh, it required some uh, recompilation, uh, but you could actually make these apps run very simply on Windows. Uh, similarly, with this, the addition of the, a little bit later of the sus subsystem for Unix-based applications. So SUA was built, it was, it was an implementation of POSIX. Uh, we, uh, we implemented the user mode APIs. Uh, we had, had mapped it to NT constructs. 
Um, but the, the ability to then port Linux or Unix in, uh, applications to this environment uh, became a selling point for many developers. Now, of course, not enough to actually have continued further than this uh, because, again, it did require a recompilation. So it wasn't just a, uh, simply a matter of taking binaries and running them under Windows. Uh, along with this, uh, a little while later, we have this project that we call the Drawbridge Project. The idea here is that we have a, a Pico process and Pico drivers that run uh, that, that spin up and kind of intercept and allow us to then plug in uh, intercepting calls. So when an application that's an, a Linux application, for example, calls to a certain uh, API in the file system, for example, in Windows, uh, this actually maps one to another so it does the, what is you know, a similar capability in Windows. And if that, if that functionality doesn't exist in Windows, then we're building it. So we're making sure that native Linux uh, executables actually working under Windows, under this Windows subsystem for Linux. So what is it? It is this ability to run native Linux ELF64 binaries on Windows. No virtual machines were harmed in the making of this subsystem, okay? This is not virtualization. This was actually one of my first thoughts when they announced that they were gonna do this. Oh yeah, we're just gonna run a Linux uh, virtual machine, we'll make it really easy, kind of like what we did with uh, Windows XP mode on Windows Vista, right? We had these XP applications running in a virtual machine and, and kind of made it look like it ran local and so on. No, we're, we're not doing that. We're actually running it on Windows, in Windows, together with Windows, working with the same file system, uh, but also taking uh, and, and, and adjusting to the differences between the different file systems, because there are, of course, very, uh, very distinct differences in the file systems. Uh, we have an LX session manager, which is the user mode session manager for, for this, uh, the Bash shell here. The Pico provider drivers are the LSXS, LXSS sys and LXcore.sys. And then, that, then we have a Pico process that hosts the shell, the bin slash bash. And here's what it looks like in a graphical form. So we have the kernel mode, which is the, uh, the operating environment, the operating system, but we do have calls in, in, in kernel mode that actually then do this mapping. So that in, in the heart of Windows, we actually have this LX core and LXSS. Uh, the bash executable is running in, in uh, user mode. It's working with a, ma a session manager, and every instance that we start up has its own environment and uh, its own shell. The file system uh, is a kind of an interesting animal, as I, as I mentioned. We have two different file systems that we have to support. Uh, and so we are going to be able, we are supporting this environment that has full fidelity Linux file system. Um, so those of you that are more familiar with Linux and, and have maybe worked with Windows, what's one of the things that's really interesting from the command line with regard to Linux versus Windows? Slash, yeah, yeah, there's a particular direction that you have to go. <laughs> and it's consistent in Linux and not so much in Windows. Uh, what else? Case sensitivity. Case sensitivity, absolutely. That's kind of the one I was going at too with these both good answers, yeah. Um, I mean, we, we have to be able to support these both these systems in a way that makes sense. So we actually have two file system drivers that are involved with this. If you're working with the piece that is the Linux file system, there's a ball FS, we've got the drive FS that is what you're in when you're using, uh, for example, the fi file explorer, Windows Explorer under Windows, uh, or navigating the file system on your C drive and so on. Now I'll, I'll show you when we get into the demonstration how uh, we can actually get into, while we're in Bash, we can actually get into the Windows file system. Um, I will carefully show you that we can, from the Windows file system, get into the Bash file system using the Windows Explorer. Um, and I say carefully because that's not something that's well uh, exposed right now and there's good reason for it, which I will, I'll tell you what that is in just a little bit here. But the whole result with this, with this uh, is the fact that we now have this ability to run Linux and Unix tools directly on Windows. So you're running the Bash shell, you've got tools that you're familiar with, such as SSH, grep, sed, awk. Uh, we, can, uh, we can actually support platforms for open source system de development, open source projects. Uh, we have uh, development tool sets such as Ruby, Python, Java, Node, uh, C++ certainly. Um, we, we, I'll show you a number of these as we get into it here. And again, uh, this is real stuff. This is not uh, virtual machines. It's on Windows, in Windows, together. It's, this is on the slide. <laughs> Give me a chance to smile at you. And do it again. Thank you. I got, a, I got a couple teammates, friends that are here today cheering me on. It's nice. All right. So how do we get this installed? Um, it does require Windows 10. Uh, it requires that you're running the 64-bit the, uh, uh, installation of Windows 10. Uh, so you have to have a supporting processor, of course, then to make that happen. Uh, it does have to be the anniversary update or newer, uh, and I say or newer because you may be running in the Windows Insider programs. Anybody here a Windows Insider? 
All right, awesome, thank you. Everybody else should be Windows Insiders. Uh, Windows Insiders are, are able to install uh, various rings, either fast or slow ring of releases. And it's cutting edge stuff, it's not stuff that we recommend you run on a production machine, but it gives you early access to the, the newest stuff that's coming out and coming along down the line. It helps you give feedback to us, it helps you kick the tires, it definitely improves the product. By the time a product, is, by the time a version of Windows is released, it's not tested by hundreds or thousands of people at Microsoft before it's released in public. It's literally tested by millions of people. So we know this is a heavy, you know, well-tested machine when it, when it uh, actually rolls out into, uh, into, the, into the wild. But uh, that said, we actually had a fast ring prior to the anniversary update that did have this included. So people were actually kicking the tires of this even before it was included with the anniversary update. Um, that said, again, remember, this is actually still beta. So even though Windows 10 Anniversary Edition is released, it came out in August, uh, the capability for the Windows subsystem list for Linux is still, uh, still improving, still uh, can be contributed to. But, what we, so this is what you need to have for making this happen, the prerequisites. Um, another prerequisite is that you turn on developer mode. This is a capability that we're building for developers. It's a functionality that we want to make sure that you're, you're agreeing that, yes, I'm a developer. Yes, I want to use my system in this way. And so you turn on this development mode um, in, the, uh, in the update settings, update the security. And I'll show you where that's at in the demo. Um, then you also have to turn on the feature. And so it's actually a Windows feature that you turn on. Uh, go into the Windows features and down, down toward the bottom, Windows subsystem for Linux. And notice it says beta next to it. Uh, that's where you actually enable it. Now once that's done, you can either go into a command prompt or PowerShell prompt, either one, both administrative, so administrator prompt, and simply type bash and hit enter. And that will then run the process of actually installing, pulling down the bits, you're actually pulling them down from Canonical and installing them on Windows. And uh, once that's up and running, you can simply, uh, any other time you want to run it, you simply run bash again, it'll run into that shell, or you can, uh, it actually installs a shortcut to a uh, canonical logo uh, application that you can run as well, and I'll show you what that is. Uh, this also points out that if you want to simply use PowerShell to enable this, you can do this. So the PowerShell command is shown on the screen here, enable Windows optional feature, uh, and then you're of course doing it online, and the feature name being Microsoft Windows Subsystem Linux. So. You install it, run bash from a command prompt. It's then going to prompt you for some additional things as well. So it's going to download and install the tool. And then, of course, the first thing you just want to, want to have is a user account, right? So it's actually going to create your first user. Uh, so you'll, you'll enter a name when it prompts you. You'll enter your password for this user. And then that is the user that, by default, when you log into this, this shell, that's the user you're using. Now that doesn't preclude you from actually creating additional users uh, and, and working with it that way, but this is kind of your default administrative user. Uh, while you're logged in as that user, of course, you're going to be using uh, sudo apt-get, sudo, of course, being the ability to sort of set uh, administrative credentials when you're running some command or something like that. So that's bash on Ubuntu on Windows. So um, I'll go ahead and give you an demo. Uh, now again, remember, if things break, it's preview, so I've got that out. I can always say, wait, it's in preview. The demo didn't work because it's in preview. Um, it's, uh, it, but we're actually running this in user mode. We're running actual, actual executables that were downloaded from, from online repositories that were actual, beta, uh, actual bits that run on Linux, now available on Windows 10. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, first, before we get into that, I'll show you where we, where we actually installed that. So I right click on the start menu, I go into programs and features, and I mentioned that under programs and features, we scroll down toward the bottom. This is where I have the Windows subsystem for Linux. So you see I do have that installed and enabled here. And also the, um, the settings, uh, updates and security. I go in here to for developers. Looks like I've got some updates to install. And notice I've enabled developer mode. And I won't install my updates right now. We'll wait for it a little bit later. Um, so then once I've done that, I mentioned I can uh, simply run an administrative command prompt. And type bash, I'll, I'll actually do some more work with a larger font for you later. But boom, there I am, I'm in bash. Now the first time you do this, of course, this is when it's actually going to do the install. So I've already done the install, it's not going to do that, it's simply going to log me into this. Uh, notice interesting thing too. Um, I'm actually put into a mount point on the on a C drive in the Windows folder in the System32 folder. Uh, does that look familiar? Well, if I exit this, that's the folder I was in in the Windows system, right? So it's actually now showing, showing me what that map point looks like when I log into the Bash shell. Now let me exit out of this and instead 
I've set up a shortcut on my start menu here for bash on Ubuntu on Windows. And this is that uh, installation that happens also. You'll find it in your, in your list of applications once you install this. Let me go ahead and make this a little bit larger so we can have some fun with this. Make sure it's all on the screen for you. Um, is that font okay or do you want that a little bit larger? Try a little bit bigger. Just a little bit bigger? All right. By the way, um, I should uh, show you as well, uh, maybe you don't know this, but um, uh, command prompts, PowerShell prompts, and even the Bash on Ubuntu on Windows has an op opacity. Opacity? Opacity? So I can actually make the window kind of see-through. That's a new feature that people don't uh, actually realize is there, but I think it's kind of interesting. I don't use it much personally, but it's kind of nice if you want to be able to see what's behind the screen when you're, uh, or behind that command window when you're working with it. All right, so how's that? Is that okay? All right, that should be okay. Good. So now I'm, I'm uh, currently just uh, deposited into, into my home folder in, in this case. So if I do an ls, of course, it's going to give me a listing of the files. So I've got a couple of demonstration folders and, and files that I've set up here for today. Um, if I change directory to the root, then I see a whole bunch of blue text that's really hard to read. But if you can make some of that out, you should, and if you're familiar with the Linux file system, some of these uh, should uh, be familiar to you. So I've got my, uh, my boot, data, uh, etc or Etsy, lib64, and so on. Uh, so these are all here, I and mean, they're all they're, you know what you expect. You install an application, it's going to install into the bin folder and, and into an application folder. Now I can also, as I showed in that, uh, that last command shell, change to uh, the C drive. Um, now what's interesting about the users folder? Well, it's a capital U, right? If I type U and hit tab, it doesn't know what to do with it. I have to enter a capital U. There you go, case sensitive my Kevrem folder and let's go to the documents folder, which is also a capital D. If I do a listing here, those are the files that, and folders that are in my documents folder. Of course, I can look at the details and permissions and all that as well. So uh, let's do a couple of, uh, well, actually, you know what, be, what it might, you might be curious about, it's going to change back to my home directory, um, is what version of Linux am I actually running here? Make sure we don't lose the bottom of the screen. So I'm going to enter LSB release dash A, thank you. And yes, it is Ubuntu 1404.5. It's the trusty release. So we can see that here. Um, walk you through some of the file system. So I can run tools and, and utilities and, and anything, uh, you know, if I want to uh, update the system, for example. Now, I don't know if I'm actually going to find a bunch, but it seems like every time I do this, I do get a whole bunch more uh, uh, updates. But I can do a sudo apt get update. Um, and it's, of course, the first time I run sudo, it has a time, it, you know, it's going to actually prompt me for that password for my account. And notice where it's actually getting the updates from. It's where we expect it to be, right? dev.nodesource.com, security.ubuntu.com, trusty updates, trusty backports. So it's, it's the same place that your Linux installations are going to get their updates from. And same thing with app get upgrade. I could do that as well. Uh, installing a file or installing some tool. Let's say I, I'm curious uh, what my fortune is. But I've already got fortune. So, and I've already got the current version, so don't have to install it. But that's as easy as it is. Just do the installation of the applications and pull it down from, from an online repository. And of course, if I run for my, what my fortune is, You'll be told about it tomorrow. Go home and prepare thyself. Okay, good. Tomorrow's a big day, David. All right. Uh, how about uh, Kause? Very important app. Actually, you know what? I should probably say since I know I should know, you should know your audience. Of course, I'm a Vikings fan and a, sort of a Twins fan, but you know, I, everybody hates the Packers, so screw them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, of course, I can port applications one to another, right? So Kause can actually tell you your fortune. Silly, silly examples. Um, back in the day, many, many years ago, when I was playing around my friend's Unix system, he showed me this incredible game that we wasted hours and hours and hours playing called Rogue. Anybody else play Rogue back in the day? Uh oh, what happened? Oh, I don't, I'm, I'm, sh I'm not using enough... Uh, Graphics real estate for this. In fact, it looks like it screwed up my. <laughs> That's interesting. 
No, let's uh, let's reopen that. There's a bug. I got to report that one. I tried just tried that, but and it cleared. But then it's still giving me and it's not giving me the uh, uh, line feed. So and that's another thing too. Uh, interesting thing between Windows and Linux file systems, right? In terms of the file formats, the, the carriage return line feed uh, is different. And sometimes you'll take a text file from one, bring it to the other, and now you've got one long stream of text instead of what looked for nice and formatted before. So those are little things that you kind of got to watch for. Um, but of course, all the editors that you're familiar with in the Linux environment are going to be available to you here. So if you love Vim or Vi or whatever, uh, you can install those and, and work with those here as well. Many of them are installed by default. Let's go ahead and close this and just reopen it so we can clear that up. All right, and uh, move that over a little bit, right? Smaller well, we don't have to run a rogue. We'll play rogue later. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, I have. A, I, I mentioned that we, we actually do have the ability to work with uh, X servers and X11 graphics, and I have, have actually installed a couple of uh, tools so to run that on, on Windows. So if I just run this uh, X server, it's going to put it down on my system tray, and it's going to make uh, that system available to me. And I do have to export the display. And I could have put that in my in my bash RC file as well, but I'm just going to do it here manually. <coughs> Is that right? Yeah, that looks right. And now um, I can run tools that I've downloaded that are graphical, such as XIs. You know, important again, important stuff, right? So there's XIs. Follows my mouse around. Uh, how about XCalc? There's a calculator. Does the calculator work? Two plus two equals four. Good. Hasn't let, me, hasn't let me down yet. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm here all night. Uh, okay. uh, what was the other one? Clock. Yeah. So just kind of a, you know silly examples of the fact that we are running these windows. Uh, run full screen if you want to. Um, in uh, and on top of Bash, but they're using that X server so they can actually get some graphics capabilities. Um, in fact, let's go ahead and close these. There's actually a fun little game. Uh, well, it was a fun little game to people that uh, really didn't like Microsoft back in the day, or, or in particular, uh, a particular uh, founder uh, called X-Bill. X-Bill is the story of X-Bill is, uh, yet again, the fate of the world rests in your hands. An evil computer hacker known only by his handle, Bill, has created an ultimate computer virus, a virus so powerful that it has the power to transmute an ordinary computer into a toaster oven. Ooh. Uh, and the, the uh, point of the game, oops, just need to exit the game here, is to, uh, to stop Bill from replacing all the, uh, the operating systems we love with Windows, right? So here he's coming in with Windows, and he's going to replace it. Oh, no, he's replacing one there. Uh, let's, let's get him. Let's, yes, let's uh, stop him before he gets there. It's a little bit bloody when you, you hit him with the mouse, but it's, uh, oh, it's addictive, hours and hours of entertainment. No, anyway, uh, go ahead and exit that. So it's interesting because, uh, you know, hey, now we love Linux and, and the, whole, the open source community is actually uh, embracing us now as well, which is in encouraging. Um, hopefully for some stuff that we're doing like this. So, uh, gosh, even beyond that, I've got a great example of another fairly intense graphic application. Um, in fact, if I uh, list my folders here, you can kind of see uh, one example, a little bit of a hint of what it is. Um, I've, I've installed the freeware version of Quake on my PC. Uh, and with some scripting and some, and some examples, and my friend Paul DiCarlo actually has a great blog post on how to get this to work. Um, I've actually got Quake running in this, in this X server. So here it is. So we can go ahead and look for, uh, look for people to shoot or whatever they are, monsters. I haven't actually found one yet. I haven't played this long enough to do it. It's really kind of dark on the end. Yeah, the screen's kind of dark there, but kind of see what you have the capability of doing here. And uh, close that out. All right, so that's just some, some example, uh, and really, again, kind of simple, silly examples, but really the proof point is that we are running native, native uh, Linux binaries on this bash shell running on top of uh, on top of Windows. And with the support of, uh, of, Ubuntu, of Canonical and their Ubuntu builds, uh, we will continue to do that. And you have a question, yeah? I was wondering about the, the X-Windows server that you're running. Is that mm -hmm. provided by Microsoft or somebody else? No, that was just, a, I found that online. It was, um, well, it was, I was pointed to it online. Um, but there's a number of versions. And this one was, actually, let me open this up. Um, 
<laughs> actually, another thing that one of my other teammates actually created a kind of interesting script, a uh, PowerShell script, actually, um, that if I open the folder here, she has it up on GitHub, so I, I, I uh, cloned it here. But if I open this folder in Visual Studio Code, and again, I apologize for part of the screen being cut off here, but she uh, has a uh, <coughs> xming x setup.ps1 file that actually prompts for the uh, prompts which which version you want to install, and actually uses Chocolaty to do the install of uh, whether or not you want to do xming or vx vxx serve, which is the one I have here. Um, and I think there was another option. No, maybe there's just the two. Anyway, she kind of scripted that to make it. But those are the, some of the some of the ones, and some of the uh, URLs are here. But you can you can install, or you can uh, search and find an uh, X server, uh, easy enough. So, uh, any other questions? Thank you for that. All right. So just a quick introduction, showing off some uh, the fact that we can actually run those binaries here, and even and even take advantage of some of the more graphical ones, uh, more graphical in nature. So we saw a user mode and kernel mode uh, participating in this, Ubuntu running in user mode, the Vast shell running there, being able to install tools on that. I didn't actually get into the developer tools yet, but as you see on the slide here, but we'll get to those in a minute. Um, running on the subsystem for Linux. Uh, it's available in, and supported in the Windows kernel, so it is a native part of the operating system that you can turn on. It's the addition of that feature. Uh, I don't know if the uh, developer mode will always be required for this feature. Uh, very, very likely it may be. But uh, the fact that we can actually work with this on a Windows system means we might be able to do with one less piece of hardware. That's not that that's the main point of this. The point is we want you to be productive in whatever way you want to be. So what works and what doesn't? Uh, this is brand new stuff. So there's going to be gaps. It's improving all the time. But you do have to be aware that there are some things that are not going to work. Uh, for example, I'm also um, getting into containerization. Anybody here work with Linux containers and Docker? Anybody? Uh, Docker containers, being able to have a, a small image that re represents an application that requires a base image beneath it, then quickly installs all the pieces it needs and runs on top of an operating system. So it's not a virtual machine. Uh, it's a virtual operating system, really. So it's the next level up. But we actually now support Windows containers now as well. Windows operating systems can be running in containers <coughs> and support containers. Um, so, uh, and that's, I'd love to be able to run Docker on Linux as an example of running Linux containers in this Bash environment. But because Linux is really just, or this Bash is really just a shell, there are pieces of the kernel of Linux that really don't apply here. Uh, so, and I would, I'm, I'm assuming that the reason Docker doesn't work in this environment is because, yeah, that requires some real knowledge of the operating system as a whole to make it work, or actually pieces of the operating system to make it work, the full, the full Linux kernel. Um, many popular tools work well uh, in testing, uh, apt-get, Ruby, git, Python, G++, Quake, important tools like Quake. Um, but there are some things to avoid. NPM has, has had some issues. Um, I've had issues with it trying to get certain things installed. Uh, the Azure command line interface, for example, uh, the cross-platform interface running on Bash, it does work really well, but there's some, uh, you know, some tricks in running the, the proper installation order in order to make it work properly. Um, Go, Rust, of course, CLR also have some issues, and those issues are being fixed even as we speak. We do want to work uh, as quickly as possible to close the gaps, and that's why we really want you to try things out as well. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, how many scenarios could there possibly be out there, right? I mean, it's, it's crazy permutations as far as number of apps and number of uh, combinations. So we do have a list that we're maintaining, and you can, you can uh, contribute it, you can watch it and watch it and, and look for uh, things that you may have tried or maybe some solutions to things you've tried that you may have found didn't work. Um, this, this list is being maintained and updated all the time. So let's talk about your developer workload using Bash. Out of the box, simple DNS tools, tools that are built for troubleshooting, curl, who is, NS lookup, these are all, these are all part of the operating environment. Uh, of course, you want to be able to do remote client connections, so SSH is supported both as a client and as a server. Um, that's actually one of the blog posts my, my uh, friend Jessica Dean put together. And I've got some links to their, their resources at the end of this deck, uh, plus a link to where you can get this deck. So if you want these URLs, you can actually have them in the deck. Uh, but SSH, she actually set up her, her Windows system as a SSH server, and she connected through it from her Mac uh, and was able to do some interesting uh, development workload through that. Um, now, that's, that's not so tricky, except she also showed how to do it with certificates. So it's automatic certificate authentication from one machine to another. No longer going to have to use PuTTY. If you want to use the SSH from the, the Bash uh, subsystem, yeah, you could just use that. Um, if you want to do it straight from Windows, then yeah, you're going to use PuTTY. 
I, you know, I honestly think there's another tool that I just heard about the other day, and I don't recall what it is, but do some searching on that because there's actually some additional pieces you can you can do in Windows. Uh, I have to investigate further to actually tell you specifically what that was, but I think there's other options. Uh, Telnet, of course. Um, integration with Visual Studio Code. This is kind of interesting. Um, and Visual Studio Code, for those of you not familiar with it, is a very lightweight open source, actually lightweight but yet very powerful because it's, it's extensible, uh, co uh, coding environment. So I can actually use this to, to build applications, many different uh, platforms, many different languages supported, many different plugins to add additional capabilities to supporting those languages and beautiful uh, IntelliSense and, and text formatting and even opening up a terminal window underneath the coding window. Uh, and that terminal window, guess what? It can be your command line, it can be PowerShell, and now it also can be Bash. So I can actually set this up to have a terminal window at the bottom of the, my coding window where I have, to have access to Bash directly. There we go. So that's my uh, next demonstration. It's kind of showing off from a developer point of view the sorts of things we can do with, with Bash here. Can we code? Yes, we can. Let's go into that again. So, um, See, I have Visual Studio Code open here, but we'll, we'll come to that in just a second. Let me show you some simple command line tools here. I happen to have a number of folders that, again, you probably recognize some of those names. So, for example, let's go into Python. So I've got a file called hello.py. How do you do hello, uh, hello world in Python? Hello world? Let's see. Yep, print hello world. Okay, so if I... Run it? Yep, Python's there, and so on Python. What about Ruby? How do you say it in Ruby? Oops. If your Python program is like twice as big as it needs to be. Is it? Just hello world? Okay. <clears throat> what do I know? I, I don't know. Um, so, uh, so I, uh, let's see. <coughs> okay, so uh, how about Ruby? Put S hello world, okay. Sure enough. Um, here's a tricky one. How about C++? David? It's like three lines of code. <laughs> it's like three lines of code. <laughs> got to instantiate every letter. Well, yeah, you got to include the out stream. You have to have a main app, <laughs> a main function, and you can uh, send it to standard out. Yep. But then the, the, the results are not, and I, of course, C++ is a compiled language, right? So I have to actually compile it. Uh, we don't have Fox Pro in here anymore. Sorry, David. <laughs> um, let's see, dash O. Nope, uh, it just says hello. Okay, so it's compiled, and I should be able to run hello. Hello world. Cool. Um, what about, uh, let's see, I've got a file here called app.js. Now again, I'm not a developer. I'm, I'm usually an IT pro, but uh, so some of these examples were built by other uh, by other people. So I say if I say things that are a little bit off, please forgive me there. Uh, but my understanding of this uh, this application is actually setting up a web server uh, and then answering to a, uh, a request. So it's actually listening on port 8000 on the local host in this case, uh, 127.0.0.1, and it's going to uh, respond with "Hello world" uh, when it's called that way. So I can. Uh, do this, run it in the background, and now it's running on uh, port 8000 at localhost, so I can do curl localhost, and I get hello world. Hey, cool. Uh, what about the browser? Yep, hello world, very tiny up there. Oh, you can't see it, wait, hold on. There it is, hello world. All right. Now, um, yeah, there we go. Let's see, any other examples here? I've got some notes here, so I don't, I don't forget to, to show you something. I already showed you Quake. Uh, let's see here. The, uh, uh, oh yeah, Visual Studio Code. Remember I mentioned that we can integrate to the terminal. So right now, I've just got the command line terminal uh, opened up when I, uh, when I choose to open that up. So the way we would do that is um, we have an option to uh, view the integrated terminal. It's just control with a back tick. 
and that'll open up the integrated terminal. But right now, my default terminal is actually running command.exe. Well, I've got an example here that I'm going to copy from my friend uh, uh, Jess's code, and I'm going to close these here. Uh, actually, it doesn't matter if they're closed. I can actually go into the preferences. So if I go to preferences, user settings, here's that file, settings.json. I'm just going to copy this all into here, and I'm going to make sure that it's not the uh, PowerShell as is enabled right now, because that's the uncommented code. Sorry if that's a bit small there. It might be a bit big there, but let's actually close this terminal here. And uh, instead, uncomment, not that, uncomment these two lines here, and comment this one out. Save it. Now go ahead and close Visual Studio Code, open it back up again. And now when I uh, open up the terminal, view, I'm actually writing the bash shell. So we can actually get our, uh, do our work here. Uh, and actually uh, do bash commands, uh, Linux commands from, and work with Linux applications right from this terminal window uh, right into Visual Studio Code. Now I'm going to open up, uh, or I'm going to create another folder in my <coughs> bash environment here. Um, and uh, actually I'm going to cheat just a little bit because I want to make sure I get all the commands in the proper way. So I've got a, a, just a, a scratch text file that I copy and paste from here. But I'm going to um, create, actually we need to uh, can I do this here? Yeah, I think I can do this here. Um, I'm going to create a, a, a I'm going to clone a, a repository. So I've created a, a repository up in GitHub that I call Jekyll Demo, and I'm going to clone it to the local system, and I'm going to uh, and I'm going to work in that folder. Um, let's actually do it in the documents folder, though. Kevram. Okay. So if I, oh, it hasn't been graded yet, wrong one. Uh, clone this repository, because I have Git installed. Pulls it down, and it's an empty repository. I just created it in GitHub, so I haven't done anything with it. If I look at what I have here, uh, let's, see, let's go to that folder that was just created. I actually have a readme, and if I look at the uh, long list of files here, there's the git ignore file as well that came down from GitHub. And, and a configuration file. So, um, so these are, uh, you know, basically I have now a new repository. Let's open that up in Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to open up that folder here. And what that'll show me is that I currently only have those two files. But I'm going to run a command to create a Jekyll application, a new Jekyll application in this folder. And we're going to see these files show up in Visual Studio Code. So if I I have to force the new because there's files already in the folder and put it in the local folder. It's going to create this new Jekyll application for me. There we go. I may see an error on this. Hold on a second. For some reason, the, well, I, I guess that worked. Let's see. Nope. Ah. Let's try this again. Again, in preview, some things work, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes they don't. You run it the second time, then it works. But now I've actually got that application created. So I can uh, go back to Visual Studio Code, and there there's those files. But what's interesting also is that these files are, 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 the files are not only here, let's go ahead and get that bigger here, but uh, because I've integrated this, and this is interesting, it's not showing this, there they are, the changes also show up in Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code also integrates with GitHub, uh, and it knows that this happens to be a repository that I've cloned. And so it also shows me that I've got seven files that have actually changed. And I can actually integrate with Git, both locally as well as with my online repository, to say, OK, commit these changes here. All right, go ahead uh, and, and uh, sync them up to my, my cloud repository. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, let's go ahead and edit one of these files. I've got a, the uh, config.yaml file is actually where the title of my web application is going to be. So I'm going to just make a modification here. Uh, go Vikings? No, I won't do that to you. Uh,
Okay, and we'll save that file. And now I'm going to go back to my, and again, I could do this from the uh, terminal window as well. Uh, it's just a little easier to see in this uh, Ubuntu window here, uh, in the bash window. So now I will go ahead and uh, Jekyll run. Is that the right command? I just want to make sure. Uh, Jekyll serve, sorry, Jekyll serve. So we'll paste that here. Uh, but I have to not type Jekyll, Jekyll, just Jekyll. There we go. All right, so the app is running, and it says uh, the server address is uh, 127.0.0.4000. So it's opened up on port 4000. And if I uh, copy that properly to the clipboard, open up a browser, go to that web application, there it is, Go Cubs. So running the local uh, that local web application, that local server. Now, this is, a, this is a partial demo, okay? And the reason I say this is a partial demo is because ultimately what I can do with this, uh, because I also have the Azure command line uh, tools installed here, I could connect to Azure from my local system. Oh, you know what, I can do that part of it anyway. Let's, let's do that. For some reason, Control C doesn't want it to stop. There we go. So, uh, yeah, I'll just go ahead and do an Azure login. If I, actually, if I just run Azure, uh, we'll actually see that the tools are installed and it'll show a nice little uh, ASCII text, Azure Cloud in there, it's kind of cool. But uh, to log into my Azure subscription, it's just Azure Login. And whenever you're using the Azure command line interface um, and, and trying to log into the account, you're given a, a note to say, go to this location, aka.ms slash device login, and enter a code in order to be authorized. So it knows that uh, this is actually coming from someone we, we trust. And that web application is actually gonna then prompt me to log into my account. So aka.ms, device login. Paste the code here. It sees that and recognizes it. And I continue, and now it's gonna prompt me for some credentials. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, use my corporate account here. So it's logged me into it in the browser. And actually, if I uh, open a new tab and go to portal.azure.com, um, I've already authenticated in this browser, so it'll actually bring me straight in there as well. But uh, back in the Ubuntu world, it says, oh, log in, okay, good, cool. So uh, I can do Azure commands. I can uh, list my resource groups, for example. Oh, maybe not. Azure, is it list group? Oh, I don't remember, anyway. Um, the, uh, oh, interesting, the default mode is Azure Server Service Management. That could be why. Uh, Azure Config Mode Azure Resource Manager. Now let's try Azure Group List. Sure enough, there they are, resource groups. Um, a little more Azure than we were supposed to be doing tonight, but the point being, I could actually run a command like this that creates an Azure website, and then I can use Git to push my changes, any changes that I make on that code in that Jekyll folder, uh, not only to GitHub, but also up to my Azure website, and use this to actually publish new changes to the Azure website uh, directly from the command line here in Bash. So just another good example of how we can connect these services in, in a workflow that really makes sense, particularly when you're, you're now getting to the point where you're publishing it to a cloud-based location, okay? So, I'm gonna give you a call to action here. As I mentioned earlier, we do need your help. Uh, this, is a, this is a solution that really needs lots of eyes, and of course, the more eyes, the better. Kick the tires for us. Um, this is in Windows 10, it's available now in the, in the current uh, public release. Um, just enable developer mode, enable the, the feature, uh, and just run bash, install it, start playing with it, and, uh, and see if you can break it. And in fact, uh, for those of you that are, are Linux experts, much more than me, uh, we'll just take a quick second to try to break our Linux uh, environment right here. So come up with some commands that might actually mess my system up, if you would. All right, think about it for right now. We'll, we'll do it in a second here. Um, do tell us what's broken. You know, give, give us examples of what works, and uh, if there are things that you want changed, certainly we want to hear about that. Um, you can share your experiences with the user voice pages at Microsoft. You can share your experiences with the team. You can share your experiences directly to the product manager. Uh, he is actually uh, making his, himself available as well. His name is Richard Turner. Uh, his Twitter is at the bottom of the screen here. 
So uh, you know, get into that user voice, go to GitHub and, and, and look at the issues, the list of issues people have found and resolution. The, 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 uh, the community has been really great. And a lot of back and forth of, well, this didn't work, that didn't work. Other people uh, give ideas of what they tried that actually did work or fixed a particular problem. And of course, the product team is eating it up and taking, taking, uh, taking good advantage of your feedback. So please, please, please do that for us. Um, here's some additional resources to get you started. Again, these are uh, links to blogs uh, from some of my teammates, as well as some resources from my blog and my Facebook location and Twitter handle is actually just Kevin Remedy. But uh, you know, if you want to contact me there, um, don't worry about writing all these down though, uh, because the last link here on this slide is aka.ms/slash. B O U O W. That uh, doesn't have to be capitalized that way. I just did it for readability. Uh, that stands for Bash on Ubuntu on Windows. So aka.ms B O U O W will get you to my OneDrive where I put this presentation. And uh, go ahead and take advantage of that. Download these and uh, take advantage of the URLs. And again, please help. Please contribute to this. We really appreciate it. Um, any other questions before we uh, try to break my Ubuntu installation here? developer mode back off? Does, that, does it stop working? I don't know. But let's wait to do that one last. <laughs> <laughs> Great, that's a good idea. Yeah? You mentioned Bash, but what about other shells? Uh, not other shells at this time, no. We've been working very closely with Canonical and, and uh, making Ubuntu work on Windows. Uh, that means we have to actually be, uh, like I said, mapping ca calls to, to like commands in the Windows subsystem or actually creating uh, the functionality on the Windows side. So what would happen if you would, if you simply install another shell? Oh, that's good. Well, I don't know. Um, that's something we could actually try. But actually, you know, you just reminded me of another demo I can do. Let me uh, before we before we do that, I'm going to close this this X server, server here. This is actually running that uh, just a windowed version. Um, I got an, actually another uh, kind of a cool example. I'm going to run a full screen. <coughs> server. Just take the defaults there. Now that full screen server of course is very black right now. There's nothing running in it. But if I go back here and uh, let's see the command was XFCE4. I've actually installed Xubuntu Desktop. Now, that took about 40 minutes to install. Uh, so it's not for the faint of heart. I've seen other Ubuntu uh, desktops available also. But if I go back to that server, you can't see the whole screen here, but I've actually got the file system list here, the home folder. Um, I can actually, uh, although I think it's going to give me an error initially when I run this, but uh, no, no, this is embarrassing. Go to the start page. I've actually got Firefox running on, on uh, Bash, on Ubuntu, on Windows. So we've got the Linux version of Firefox running here. So uh, yeah, uh, you, can, you can do a lot with this. But uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna, you know, if it can, if it can be installed as another shell, we could certainly try it, but I don't know. Well, why can't you just try it? Well, I, I don't know how to do it. Do you tell me how to oh, do it? Oh, apt get, sudo apt get install, let's say tcsh. Okay, let me close this up here. Just for fun. Yeah, for fun, for sure. All right, apt, oh, sudo, get install. tcsh. All right. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Okay. Get that. Well. So then, what do I do? T C S H. How do I know I've got TCSH? I'm, because I've, I don't have colors, I guess that was one, <laughs> that's one indication. Uh, well, you can PS. 940. Okay. PS. Oh, it's up there. It's yeah. On the list. Oh, there it is. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. Seems to be working. Let's see. I, I mean, you know, you can run a test suite or something like that. Yeah. So that's that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, 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 CC. Space, TCSH. PS. Hmm. So, Bash is no longer running, TCSH is replaced. All right. 
Good to know. Thank you. Let's uh, get another one up here. Um, what would you like to do? If, if you tried the GitHub, I'm sorry, it's GNU image manipulation program. It's oh. Photoshop. It's like oh, no. I haven't tried it, but no, uh, you know, the, the, um, I'm going to guess it would work, but I, I haven't, uh, haven't tried it. Let me, uh, I don't have a pen here, shoot. Um, let, me, let me get that from me at the end here, because I definitely want to try that. Yeah. It and you, might it, be, you said you installed the desktop, right? Yeah. Okay. It might be included, so just, you know, enter, see what happens. Uh, what was it again? G, let's see, I don't, have the, I don't have the server running. Let me just go ahead and run the, run the server again here. Uh, Okay, so say again. G-I-M-P, GIMP. GIMP, okay, couldn't quite hear you. Cannot open display, all right. Um, do I have to export display? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> 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 How did I do that? Look at that. <laughs> so it's obviously not important. Oh uh, yeah, look at that. You file new. Okay. Cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it does. You know, there's actually a 3D paint now available. That's uh. You can actually build 3D, yeah, 3D uh, paint. Uh, look in the window store for it. Um, yeah, is it? Is it? Do you know, David? Is it widely available the the 3D paint in Windows? 3D what? There's a 3D version of Paint, Microsoft Paint. Oh, okay. Uh, I knew it was a, it, was, it was a rumor for a while, and then it they. Right may, oh, was it an insider thing? Yeah, maybe maybe where it will be. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Other things you want to try? Well, let's let's try to break it. Let's let's go ahead and just do that. Uh, discard changes. Run system B. Okay. Say what? <laughs> do it again. Go ahead. Run system B. Run. No, no, no. Uh, system. System. Uh, pseudo get act get. System D. Is that one word? System D. Install. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, install. install. Uh, no installation candidate by that name. Services? Okay. Now what? Yeah, maybe not. It's already in there. Yeah, it looks like it didn't install because it might be there already. So what do I do with it? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> All right, while you're, while, yeah, while you're thinking of that, let me just go ahead and... Uh, Sure, I turn off developer mode, see what happens with that. All developers. Can I actually do that? Silo apps. Oh, do you know David? Is that a one time <laughs> choice? I'm going back. I was going to ask you, I'm actually not familiar with developer mode. What does it do? Well, it lets you side load apps. Oh, I see. But it's also required for the subsystem for Linux. I'm not sure if uh, just turning on sideloading apps will turn off developer to mode. I, that's as much as I can do. It looks like you can't actually turn it off. I was told you click that button and get fired. No, that's not true. <laughs> you know we have the, the, the uh, what's that called, the moonlighting clauses? That we, yeah. So, uh, and I may require a restart too, but I'll just go ahead and close this and try reopening it up again. I don't, yeah. Well, hey, you know what? Look at that. You don't. You're not running that now, <laughs> so you do need that. On. Okay. Did you get it turned off? Well, I, uh, it's side loading apps only and not developer mode. And then it just didn't load. So it just wouldn't run. Yeah. Uh, interesting. So if it was already running, would it stop it, or would it prevent you from? Let's see. You know, in other words, let's suppose you have something going on. Yeah. Well, it doesn't appear to stop it. Okay. But uh, won't let me run it again. Oh, I mean, I mean, I mean. oh yeah. Um, 
on. Let's go ahead and turn that back on again. Oh, I don't think I have installed though. What do you want? Is it a big uh, application? It should, I don't think it should. Well, then we might be standing here watching it download. So, uh, any other questions while we're uh, installing more stuff? Um, you have to, well, in, in the uh, shell, you can navigate to the file system, the Windows file system, but, and also in the Windows file system, you can navigate to the Linux system, and I'll actually show you where that's at. Um, but when I show, after I show you this, you have to promise me you'll never go there, uh, only because, um, I've, like I said, you can actually mess things up. But it's actually under an app, the app data folder local under your profile, and it's the uh, LXSS folder. So here's my, here's my file system. That's, that's kind of where it's hidden. Um, but again, you know, do be careful. <laughs> you know, if I start going in here and, and start editing files, uh, my, my C++ application, for example, I mean, I can, I've actually just corrupted uh, entire folders, uh, <laughs> folder sub, uh, uh, subtrees by uh, playing around with files using the, the Explorer here in Windows. So it's, it's very, very uh, delicate right now. I suspect that they're going to try to make it more robust eventually and maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe not even hide it as much as they are here. But uh, for right now, it's very delicate. So yes? Oh, good, okay. So Emacs, there we go. Cool. Do what, I'm sorry? The, the, uh, Started a new shell, so the export is going here. Okay. Oh, all right. Yeah, you're right. So, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. So let's. Uh, I didn't probably didn't have to do so that. False. Got it. Is my server still running? Yeah. You've already showed this, but the clipboard works back and forth between the bash and other window stuff. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, it's a, it's a right click, but yeah, you can pay, paste that way. So Control V, no, <laughs> right click on a mouse. Yeah, that paste. Yeah. So what kind of thing you try to uh, open those window programming for something? Would it get mad at you or did it? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. I, th I should think it'd be nice enough. To, it would be nice of them to say, "Oh, well, that's a Windows program. We'll go ahead and open it up in, in a window." But honestly, I haven't uh, haven't given it a try. I have to give that a try. I don't think I have a console app that can. Uh, so, oh, by the way, so what am I? What am I supposed to? While we're in the Emacs piece of it, what am I supposed well, to say? Well, it should open up an editor, and it should have a display screen, and it has failed. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that piece didn't uh, didn't work so great. So you can there you go. Well, that's what I'm expecting you guys to. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, let's see. What do I have? Uh, well, uh, where's Notepad installed? I have no idea. There it is. Oh, nope. That's uh, the answer to that question. Okay, cool. Thank you, though. This is great. I'm learning so much. To, I appreciate you guys doing this. Great. Anything else? Well, you know how to reach me, and I really appreciate your time tonight. Hopefully, you found this useful. Um, enjoy your evening, and uh, safe travels home. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, that, was, that was the end, by the way. <laughs>